Hello my friends and welcome back. It's Wednesday my dude, so you are gonna have a fantastic day or evening if you're coming from work. Today I have a little surprise for you because we are looking at a pontoon bridge that gave itself in as a POW. Oh, you thought I was kidding. No, look at this. This is a Russian pontoon bridge floating downstream into Ukraine. Yes, the situation is that this river crosses the Ukrainian-Russian border and this pontoon was deployed on the Russian side, but the stream carried it away. So now it is flowing into Ukraine. So how can we view this? Well, I think this pontoon bridge wanted to live, survive and fight against tyranny. So it surrendered itself as a POW to the Ukrainians to fight against the Putin tyrannical regime. Way to go, pontoon bridge. We would uh, consider this as captured, not destroyed. And I'm sure Ukrainians will not change this pontoon bridge when a POW exchange happens. It doesn't want to go back to Russia. But my friends, now we will not jump into Ukraine. We will jump into Romania. Yes, because Romanian military is going to be on steroids in 2024. They have also understood and read the lessons from the Ukrainian war correctly, increasing their military spending by 45%, which is insanely large. For a country to increase spending on something like that, it doesn't really happen that much in democratic uh, countries. But in Romania, they can do it. I'll read you what they will buy for it. The Romanian army receives a huge budget in 2024, a budget that exceeds 20 billion euros for defense, almost 45% higher than the amounts allocated in 2023. And this includes 32 F-35 Lightning IIs, worth 6.5 billion. Now, I love the F-35s. Do you know how much I love it? Well, <laughs> look at this. A stone and soldier wrecks the F-35 three years ago. Let's look at the year, which is, it was, I think, 2021. And look at me. Look at, look at this dude, just fresh out of, out of a military. My uniform in the back. This was like two apartments ago. It's a rental, of course. Uh, I was reacting to F-35. I was amazed by it. And I'm so glad about any country who's buying it. Finland, for example, is buying F-35s. We Estonians, we don't have money for that stuff, so we rely on the Finnish, our Nordic brothers, to keep us safe from the Russians. Thank God they're buying the F-35. 32 additional F-16 Fighting Falcon in the M-652 configuration, spare engines and local support, worth 388 million. 21 Watchkeeper X UAVs worth 410 million. 18 Bayraktar TB2 combat drones worth 321 million. I would say Bayraktar is one of the best and cost-effective drones in its class because it's a lot cheaper than its, you know, mostly Western counterparts. And it does the job very efficiently, as we see in Ukraine. Unfortunately, they're quite easy to shoot down. So if the enemy which is Russia, has any kind of anti-air capabilities close to Romania, well, then these drones will be shot down, unfortunately. This is what happened in Ukraine also. Ukraine has lost most of their Bayraktars. But not before these Bayraktars wreaked havoc on the Russian endless convoys trying to take Kiev or Kharkiv. Two Airbus military helicopters worth 150 million. 54 M1A2 main battle tanks worth 1.07 billion. Two Scorpene submarines worth 2 billion. Romania's getting two new submarines. Hell yeah. When is Estonia getting submarines? Oh yeah, never because we, we don't have the cash for it. They're expensive. We're trying to keep our country running. Two new Corvettes. Two upgraded and armed T-22 frigates. Three upgraded missile carriers. With NSM missiles, two new diver starships, and new tugs. What's next? I'm gonna, like, I scroll down, we're gonna see spaceship. Like, one new spaceship. One new space base on a moon. All jokes aside, this is a very notable addition to Romanian Navy. Seven Patriot missile air defense batteries worth 3.9 billion, which is enough to defend most of Romania's biggest cities. I mean, Patriot is an amazing anti-air defense system. The only issue is that Russia can just saturate the areas where the Patriot is with cheap drones, wasting the Patriot's ammunition, which is unbelievably expensive. Patriot is good because it's very precise, very effective, works almost 100% of the time, 
But the ammunition is so expensive. And if you have like $40,000, $50,000 costing Iranian drones by the thousands flown your way, you don't want to be using Patriot against it. You want to be using the German Gepard. 54 HIMARS launchers, an 81 GMLRS, an 81 alternative warhead GMLRS, 54 attackums, 24 AFADs, worth 1.25 billion. Love this again because this is the first edition in this list that I can say as a proud Estonian that we are also buying. We are buying, and correct me if I'm wrong, eight Patriot systems. See, Estonia having very limited funding, we have to make every spending decision in the military thinking that what is the most cost effective. Not what is the best or what is the cheapest, but what is the most cost effective. So we never buy the very best, we never buy the cheapest. We buy the one that gives us most bang for the buck. That's what uh, smaller countries have to think about. We will probably never buy tanks. We will probably never buy huge warships or uh, fighter jets. What we will do is buy anti-countermeasures uh, for these things. We don't, we don't have a navy, but we have anti-ship missiles. We don't have tanks, but we have very good anti-tank capabilities. We don't have an air force, but we're buying a short-range and mid-range anti-air defense systems. This is how we think as a small country. 58K2 Thunder Artillery worth 1.92 billion. This is the second edition in this list that I, I can say as a proud Estonian that we also are buying. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think these are already present in Estonia or they are arriving very soon. Uh, South Korean military exports are getting a huge expansion into Europe after European countries switching from German arms to South Korean and American arms manufacturers because Germany was unfortunately very slow to react at the beginning months of the war. So a lot of countries already made these purchases with the South Koreans and USA. Now that in my eyes Germany is reacting more accordingly to the war than other European countries, it's already too late. A lot of the countries have switched uh, already. This shows you how important is quick and swift reaction to a conflict. You might lose your biggest partners. 377 Piranha V worth 1.6 billion. Okay, this list goes on. I don't want to take up more of your time. You get the point. They are on steroids. Thank you Romanians, thank you Romanian government for taking the lessons in Ukraine seriously and acting accordingly. The other European nations should follow suit. Now I want to go uh, and talk about the Russian people. See, th since the very first days of the war, I was saying that this is not only Putin's war, it's the war of Russian people. And then I got hate comments. In 2022, yes, I got hate comments from the West saying that no, this is Putin's war because at that time, the Western people were trying to blame it all on Putin. They didn't know yet and, and say that the people are innocent. Now, I was saying it then and I'm saying it now and I have a survey backing this up that this is not Putin's war. It's the war of the Russian people and their mindset. They choose it in Russia. I'll read you the thread. Yesterday, Ukrainian media reported that sociologists from the University of Chicago conducted a classic survey in Russia with over 1,000 respondents indicating that about 63% of the population actively supports the war against Ukraine. 58% of the respondents supported Russia's domestic policy, 67% supported its foreign policy, and 66 planned to vote for President Putin's continuation in the spring elections. So, well over half, and Putin's ratings have always been very high, extremely high in Russia in his 20 plus year ruling time. So, Russian people like Putin. They like the way Russia is going. They like the idea of Russia as an empire. So you cannot really separate Putin from his people because they have chosen him. Uh, not democratically by elections, but they like what he's doing and they, they support it. They stand behind it. So in this way, there is a collective responsibility for people living in Russia and doing nothing, then they are automatically collectively responsible in my eyes. If you don't agree with me, put it in the comments and I will read it. I like seeing other people's mindsets. Now, my friends, Ukrainian SPU posted a video of their Alpha group, so their uh, best special forces group using kamikaze drones. They post these videos once or twice a month. And in this one, it's all public and it's in Twitter, it's in Ukrainian Defense Ministry's homepage. 
There's something very peculiar about this first image here. It's a whole squad on top of a Russian BMP. They get a hit, it's, you know, demilitarized. But look at this, Arthur's army. So the Ukrainian SPU Alpha Group is using Arthur's army's drones as we speak in demilitarizing the orcs. And after the kabooming happened and all the squad dismounts forcefully because they got kaboomed out of the existence into the oblivion, another drone comes and hunts them down, liberating Ukrainian soil man by man from the occupants. And again, we see Arthur's army here. So these drones work. We're sending more in January 24th. I'm going to be in Kiev again in January. Uh, and me and Noel together, we're going to give huge amount of drones to different Ukrainian units. So if you want to be part of helping Ukrainians liberate their land and demilitarize the occupants, keep an eye on my channel. I will give you an opportunity to contribute uh, in a way that most directly helps Ukrainian military. And I'll document the whole part of the process so you see where your money is going and you get the videos after. Now, my friends, I'll touch a subject that I, in 2022 I remember covering almost daily, but then it became, in 2023 it became also a, a daily occurrence and it became very repetitive. So I stopped and most of the military bloggers stopped this uh, topic. But now it's time to sum it up. So what is it? It is about fires. Russia is burning quietly and secretly. Why do I say quietly and secretly? Well, because there's many videos about it every day, but since it's so repetitive, most of the military bloggers don't talk about it anymore. But I'll sum it up for you so we know the statistics. This year, the Molfar agency documented 939 fires, uh, which is 2023. In 2022, there were only 416. So in 2023, the most often it was factories, 38%, warehouses, 38%, and shopping malls, 12.6%. Moscow region was on fire most frequently, 162 incidents. And I remember covering these uh, time to time, and mostly they are warehouses and factories, as we could see, 60 to 70 percent mix of warehouses and factories connected to the armed forces of Russia. Military warehouses, military factories, components factories. Now, this is a huge blow to the Russian war effort because building factories takes an insane amount of time, and you do need very good machinery that is inside the factories, which mostly is made in the West or in Taiwan, right? Well, it is sanctioned. So you burn it down, you cannot build another one. That's how it is in Russia. Of course, Russia is a huge country and burning down factories, you cannot take this country down by burning down their factories, but it is a death by a thousand cuts. You destroy one machining factory, there is a lack of one component, and this is a bottleneck in making a T-90 or making an Orlan drone. So that is the issue, making the SU-35, you know. And they have these bottlenecks in production, logistical errors, logistical chain bottlenecks that stop the whole production because the one factory in Chelyabinsk burned down and they cannot make this very small glass part for the optics. That's how it works. So it's a huge blow, these fires. And they're mostly started by partisans or vigilantes, you know, civilians who secretly don't like the regime and just don't want any fame, just pull the match and run away. Nobody knows who did it, but suddenly a whole building is on fire and the logistical chain has to wait for two or three months before they can fix it. So these fires do a lot of damage to Russia. Now, my friends, I'll show you November NAFO convoy video, which, yeah, 2023 November, when I delivered these 50 kamikaze drones to SPU Alpha. Uh, there's a three-minute part I want to show you introducing Estonians fighting in Ukraine for Ukraine and Estonia. They're fighting for the freedom of all, whole Europe, but they're my countrymen. That's what I, I want to give them credit. Hello, my friends. We're right near, now here in Kiev in the Lover Monastery. And these guys you see right next to me, four guys, they are Estonians, like me. Five Estonians right here in Kiev. You see the blue, black and white. So this is for me, first time in my five times in Kiev when we're handing cars and they're actually Estonian fighters here with us. So thank you for coming and also thank you for fighting for Estonia and Ukraine. Thank you for all the support. <laughs> and... Um, Every Estonian knows what it means to be under the Soviet occupation and these guys know it the most because they have actually physically gone into this country and they're fighting on the front line against Russians right now. So in the future we can talk about fundraising stuff for these guys also.
this is the part again when I'm gonna explain what it means. Slava Ukraini, Heroem Slava. Glory to the heroes. These guys in my eyes are heroes. They're my countrymen who have put their lives in danger so we can live in peace here in Estonia and the rest of Europe and also in the US and also so Ukrainians can live. Respect to these guys and let's talk about funding them in the future because they do rely on donations. My friends, on these photos you can see a Russian, let's call it the United States way, forward operating base. It's not that, but it's, it's a Russian frontline repair base. Now these are extremely important because trucks, infantry fighting vehicles, everything, every machine breaks down on the front lines. That's how it is. Mod, bullets, kamikaze drones, it breaks down, it needs a fixture. Now it's something small that can be fixed on the front. Why transport it to the repair factory? facility 1000 kilometers away. Now you just bring it to a repair shop, uh, which is established on the front. These are very vital. They repair them very quickly, two, three days and send it back to the front. Now Ukraine struck this one. Machine, uh, cars, um, trucks, infantry fighting vehicles are bunched together. They're being repaired. You take them out. It's a high value target hit, very efficient hit. It all burned to the ground. Now Ukraine and Russia both rely on such facilities because as I said, everything that moves will break down on the front sooner or later and they need to be repaired. If they cannot be repaired, there is no point in sending that stuff to the front because it will break down and you can't use it anymore. It needs to be able to be repaired. Now Ukraine taking out these shops, repair shops uh, of the Russians is a huge issue, huge blow to the Russians again. Why do I talk about it? Because it, it's boring. You know, it's, it's a repair shop repairing these old buses you could see there or uh, civilian trucks that Russians use. It's, it's not very flashy, no huge, huge explosion scene, but I want to open up how vital is it to destroy such things. Now, my friends, we'll jump back to Moscow. Moscow is freezing. It's cold all over Europe. Right now, it's actually getting better, but it was. Past week, it was like minus 30, minus 25 Celsius. Uh, I'll read you the text also. Karl Marx Street, 47A, second entrance. It's the fourth day without heating. And what happens if it's minus 30 Celsius without heating? Well, you can see all of the windows are frozen. The hallway has minus, it's like outside. Uh, the entrance is completely iced over, the whole house is without heating, all the radiators blew up. Yes, because when the central heating system of a panelka, which this one is, panelka is a Soviet-style panel housing thing, a central heating system fails, which it does in Moscow quite often because they don't really renovate their panelkas, then all of the pipes blow up because they're filled with water, hot water, when, when it fails, the water cools down, expands when it frozes, and boom, all of the pipes go, meaning you cannot just fix it. You've got to replace the entire piping system, which is an extensive work, so much work. Uh, too much for, you know, the mindset they have in Moscow. They don't want to do it. They would demolish the house before doing that. So it, it requires a lot of maintenance. Basically, this panelka is screwed, and it's private pop property, meaning people own these apartments, they don't have anywhere else to go and the government is not going to fix it because it's so much work and they don't like maintenance like that, so they're screwed. They're living with minus 30. That's condition of the entrance of the fourth day of the entire house. In one banelka there's what 100 families can live in and they have to live like that, children have to live like that in Moscow. It's very sad to watch honestly. This is what it looks like. Ice inside of the hallways and everything. Apparently they are tired of coming here. They, there are a few fitters who have been fixing something in the house for the fourth day and that's all. It's five degrees Celsius in our apartments. Everyone who could left uh, or self-evacuated. Yeah, it's five degrees because they are, you know, heating the room somewhat with their body heat, uh, surrounding themselves with blankets and using the electrical heating. But that would be extremely expensive. Uh, and it doesn't do much. So, uh, well, those who stay here surviving as best as they can, people warm themselves with gas, all kind of heating devices. Yeah, you gotta, you have this old gas stove because that's mostly the mainly used uh, stove type in Russia, all of Russia. You just put them all on full blast and put the flames up and that's how you heat the house. So, very expensive, uh, very inefficient. That's the only way. Another, another thing is panelkas don't have really insulation because they were built in the 70s and 80s. So they, what's, it, what's outside is inside. And if the heating fails, it will get cold really fast. 
It's a very bad situation because these are civilian families who are suffering. But Putin has every kind of possibility to fix this. He has the money, he has the power, but he doesn't use it, unfortunately. Now, my friends, let's watch that Russia's and Ukraine's artillery shell usage data. 2023 summer where Ukrainian counteroffensive was going on, uh, Ukraine used 7,000 artillery shells per day. Now, that went on for 30 days, a month, when they were doing their counteroffensive, which... Yes, failed. Uh, Russia was using then about 5,000 per day. Now, today, Ukraine is using 2,000 per day and Russia is using 10,000 per day. This is mostly because of North Korea and Iran who are supplying Russia with their artillery shells. Now, these Ukrainian shells, 2,000 of them, do as much damage as the Russian 10,000 because Ukrainian shells are many times more accurate and they fire many, they have to fire them less because they hit faster, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, tuning up or gearing up artillery shell production is insanely painful process. The logistical chain for that and the precise machinery and everything, it, it's not that easy. Like Gearing up uh, cheap kamikaze drone production is many times more easier than gearing up heavy big artillery shells production. So European countries are trying to do that, USA is trying to do that, but in 2024, bad news for you, my friends, and for Ukraine, the production of Western artillery shells is not increasing like tenfold. It's increasing maybe two times max. It takes time to do this. So this graph won't change much. How Ukraine can change it is very massive heavy usage of cheap kamikaze drones and developing anti-gemming capabilities. My friends, now it's time for my favorite part of the video, butchering of the Patreon names. And today, for the first time in what, two years, I will read you 10 Patreons. You heard correctly. You're going to hear, hear 10 names in a way that your ears will bleed. So if you can't handle that, you got to click away. Scott Timpani, Paul Delano, Bob R38, William Yetiares, Val E, Master of Svag, Carter Busk, Sverre Hval, Henry J. Winters, Jeff Tech. This is it. If you're one of these guys, I mean, you will never hear your name said in the same way again. Thank you for your support. And if you like my channel, become a patron, become a sergeant of Arthur's army. And send me a message because I'll answer all messages on Patreon. Until my next video, my friends, which will be tomorrow. Slava Ukraini and bye bye.